The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. David said the heavens declare the glory of God. And the fundamentals show it his handiwork. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his solar supply. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. Well, well, he's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. And he's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. He's august. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. Well, he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in high criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. And that's my king. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He's star caught and he dies. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. And he delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? Well, my king is a key of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. He's a master of the mighty. He's a captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the lord of lords. That's my king. Yeah. 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 That's my king. My king, yeah. his office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Well, I wish I could describe him to you, but he, he's indescribable. He's indescribable. Yes. Yeah. He, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you, the heavens of heavens cannot contain him, let alone a man explaining him. You can't get him out of your mouth. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. And Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. Yeah! He always has been, and he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. 
You can't even teach him, and he's not going to resign. That's my point. That's my point. Time, time is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. The glory is all his. Time is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And ever, and ever, and when you get through with all of the forever, then amen. And the rest of us will be in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And we'll begin in verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors which led led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God, and the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also is written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged derailed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breast and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off, beholding these things. Easter is a love story. Now, when I say a love story, I'm not talking about Harlequin Romance or Danielle Steele or any of those other novels. I'm talking about true love. The word love, Greek word agape, it's a sacrificial love. It's a sacrificial love. It's the love where you put another one's well-being above your own. It's a love where you sacrifice for the other person. It's a love that leads mothers to leave the workforce so that they can raise their children. A, a love that leads fathers to make decisions that don't necessarily benefit their career but benefits their family. It's, it's a love where a husband will give up his dreams for his wife and a wife will give up her dreams for her husband. It's a love where, where parents sacrifice for th of themselves for their children. There's a there's a bumper sticker I saw one time that said your parents used to be cool until you came along. You know, when before we were before we were parents, uh, we were cool and we were just doing our own thing. And then when we became parents, we had to do what was in the best interest of the child, which in some cases turned us into really boring people. And we're not the same people we were. I'm not the same person I was 12 years ago, and I thank God for it. But you know, we, we gave up a lot. We sacrificed a lot for our children. We would buy something really nice to put in the house, and there's something really nice, and we put it in the house, and the kid breaks it, and you have that thought that goes through your head. Well, I guess we just can't have anything nice around here. You know, you sacrifice having those nice things around the house for, so you can bring those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Love is self-sacrificial. True love puts the other one's needs and well-being above their own. And that's the type of love that Christ demonstrated when he died on the cross for our sins. Jesus said in John chapter 15, he said, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. 
greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus says that he is demonstrating the ultimate love, the ultimate love in that you're laying down your life for your friends. I've got a friend who is a police officer in Jacksonville, and he was killed in the line of duty, and that is, uh, that is what is on his headstone. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. That's true love. Soldiers on the battlefield have true love for each other. They may not say it that way, but they're giving their lives for each other, and they're giving their lives for their country. That's sacrificial love. That's true love. Jesus went far and above in his demonstration of love for us. He left the glory of heaven to dwell among men. He left the glory of heaven to live in Israel during the first century when there was no air conditioning, there were no cars, there was no internet, there was no TV, one of the toughest times to live in, to be born of a people who was one of the toughest groups of people to live in because they were constantly being oppressed, went through all that suffering to live among men. He grew up in a bad town. He grew up in the city of Nazareth. And the Bible says, uh, Nathaniel said, can any good come out of Nazareth? He didn't even live in the best neighborhood. There, in some of those cities, they had walls that separated the good neighborhoods from the not-so-good neighborhoods, the high-class neighborhoods from the working-class neighborhoods. And if you lived in the working-class neighborhood, you didn't go to the upper-class neighborhood unless you were a servant. Uh, he grew up in a bad town. He was raised the son of a carpenter. His ministry was carried out without glitz and glamour. Jesus didn't have a TV show. He didn't have a radio ministry. He, he didn't have a seed offering fund or anything like that. He walked. He ministered. He preached, he lived as a homeless man during his three and a half years of ministry, and then when it was all over, he was executed in the worst way possible, in a way that was uh, reserved for the worst criminals. During his ministry, and ultimately his expression of love on the cross, he was rejected and mocked by men. Still, he went through with the plan of salvation. People rejected him. People made fun of him. People... They, they tried to set him up for failure. They tried to set him up to make him look like an idiot. And he went through with a plan of salvation anyway. That's love. Your kids oftentimes get upset with you. And they say mean, mean things to you. And they, they, uh, they, they sometimes reject you. Maybe sometimes they mock you. But you still love your kids. And you still bring them up. And you still follow through with them. And that's the same way Jesus went through all that rejection, all that mocking. But he still went through with, his, with the plan of salvation on the cross. At any time, he could have turned back from it. Yes. He went through with the plan of salvation, and he made that salvation available to everyone, even those who mocked him. First thing I want to look at in the scriptures this morning is that Jesus was numbered with the sinners. In verse 32, he says, And there were also two other malefactors, malefactors, bad people, bad criminals, the Bible describes them in other books of the Bible as being thieves. There were two others, thieves, led with him to be put to death. So after a ministry of healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, preaching the gospel to the poor, binding up the brokenhearted, feeding the hungry, Jesus is now to be executed in the same company as the worst criminals in the country. Now, this wasn't where Jesus belonged I mean, Jesus was the son of God he was God in the flesh we beheld his glory he was innocent he was pure Pilate couldn't find any fault in him Pilate examined him every way possible couldn't find any fault in him couldn't find any legal reason to even cast him in jail let alone have him executed the Jews put him on trial in front of the Sanhedrin it was an illegal trial they had the trial at night you weren't supposed to have trials at night it was a kangaroo court. It was a sham. They brought him in there for one purpose, and one purpose only was to get a guilty conviction, to get a guilty ruling. They lined up false witnesses against Jesus. Those witnesses couldn't get their testimony to agree, but yet they still came to a conviction. Now, if, we go on, if one of us were to go on trial in the Brown County Court, and I'm sitting there, and I'm on trial, and there are two people, and one of them said that I was at the corner of 5th and Main at 5 o'clock Monday, and the other one said I was at the corner of... Uh, of Coleman and, and bluff you at 5 o'clock on Monday, then they've got witnesses having me in two different places. I get off, I walk, I, I'm not guilty 
by reason by reasonable doubt. And these two witnesses could not get their testimony to agree, but yet they still convicted him. He, he didn't deserve to be on that cross. He didn't deserve to be carrying that cross up the hill. He didn't deserve to be on trial, but yet there he was. He's going to be crucified between these two criminals. The king of kings, the lord of lords, was as in low of a spot as anyone could possibly be. Have you ever been incarcerated for any reason? And is that not a low place to be? And you, if you were incarcerated, you weren't facing the death penalty. But here Jesus is facing the death penalty, and he is in as low of a spot as he can possibly be as far as the way we see things here on this earth. But he didn't back down. In fact, it wasn't even a surprise that he was there. That was where he was intending to go the whole time. He chose to be there. He chose to be there. He went there willingly because he knew by going there and by overcoming that, he would pave the way of salvation for the rest of us. He would become the way of salvation. Jesus said in John 12, 27, he said, Now is my soul troubled. So this is a troubling thing for him to go through. This is something that he's concerned about. This is something that, that he knows that he's going to endure a lot of pain and he's going to endure the wrath of God. He says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. How many times have you heard preaching on the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was praying that God would let him not go to the cross? God wasn't forcing him to the cross. Jesus went to the cross willingly. He wasn't praying to get out of the gospel. He wasn't praying to get out of the death, burial, and resurrection. He was, pray he was offering a prayer of, submissive, of submission to God, pr praying that this is the way it has to be done, and I'm going to go through it. That's what Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He wasn't saying, Father, please save me from this hour. That's not what he was saying, because in verse 27 of John chapter 12, he says, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Jesus came to earth for this hour that he would die on the cross, that we would preach and teach and study and learn and internalize for the rest of this time on earth that we would study the gospel because that's the reason he came to earth. He came to earth in order to die for our sins, to be buried, and to raise again from the dead on the third day to give us new life and salvation and hope. Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says... Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. So he came up with the idea. The idea was his. He went through it voluntarily. When somebody is the author of something, they are the creator of something. They conceived something. This was Christ's idea. It was his plan. It was his ambition to be the author and finisher of our faith, the finisher. He went through with it. He completed it. He endured it all the way to the end, despising the shame. He endured the cross, despising the shame. It was a shameful thing to be crucified. You were hung up there, basically naked and suffering in front of everybody. And while you're hanging up there suffering, everybody's making fun of you. You are the, you are the, uh, the butt of everyone's jokes. They, they uh, would throw things at you. They would yell insults at you. You would have the birds that would be pecking at you because they're, they're, they're seeing dinner coming around very soon, and that's Jesus hanging there on the cross for our sins, but he endured the cross, despising the shame. doesn't mean he hated the shame, although I'm sure he hated the shame. That word despise means that he made it look like nothing. He overcame it. He put it aside. When you, when you overcome something and, and you overcome it well, you despise it. You put it under you. You step on it. That's what Jesus did with the shame of the cross. He, desp he despised it. He overcame it. He was the author and finisher of our faith. He went there willingly. He despised the shame, endured the cross. Why? For the joy that was set before him. Who's the joy that was set before him? That's you. All of those who will know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior throughout all eternity, that's the ones that Jesus was looking to, was looking forward to, was doing this for. He endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy. You are the joy that was set before Christ, for the joy that was set before him. What about the riches of heaven, Leland? He had that before he came to, before he came to earth. He prayed in John chapter 17, he, that, he, talking to God. He said, Thou lovest me before the world ever was. So God and Jesus had a close relationship in heaven before the world was ever created. And now here's Jesus hanging on the cross. 
John chapter 10, Jesus said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So Jesus is willfully going to the cross. He is the author of our faith. He is the finisher of our faith. God gave the approval of the plan of salvation. God sent him to complete the plan of salvation. Now here's Jesus voluntarily laying his life down. He's going to take it back, and he is going to demonstrate his love. And because he demonstrated his love, because he laid his life down for those who would know him as his personal Savior, and by the way, he paid for the sins of the entire world when he was on the cross, First John chapter 2, verse 2. But in particular, let's look at the people who would repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. He's looking forward to them. He, takes, he has the power to lay it down. He takes the power to take it up again, and he completes the plan of salvation. This is the ultimate demonstration of love because he was willing to humble himself to save us. He was willing to come down off of the throne, to go down onto the earth, to be put up on the cross, to be put in the grave, to rise again, to be rejected, to be mocked, to be made fun of. He was willing to do all that. He humbled himself because he loved us. Yes. People need to humble themselves because they love others. You know, that's what true love will do is it will it will be humble you know guys you know they you know, I'm you know my wife is not the boss of me she does whatever I tell her to da 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 da, da, da. he needs to humble himself before his wife women I don't need no man to take care of me I don't have to listen to my husband my husband's just an idiot anyway she needs to humble him herself before her husband you know, the Bible says, why submit yourselves unto your husbands? If Christ could submit himself to what man put him through, wives can submit themselves to their husbands. Man, husbands, Bible says, love your wives. Do you have any idea what that means? If you've been married any length of time, you do know what that means, hopefully. It means to sacrifice, to give up, to forego things. Maybe it means that to take care of your wife's needs, there won't be a bass boat in your future. You'll make that sacrifice. It, it means that you may have to let your friends know that you do have a wife at home and you do attend to her needs when she does call upon you. It's, you know, it's, we try to put that cell phone away that, you know, well, that's, that's nothing. That was your wife, wasn't it? Oh, no, no, it wasn't my wife. Yeah, that was your wife. You need to go take care of that. Okay, I'll see y'all later sometimes you know you have to see them later but that uh, love is sacrificial it's self-sacrificial christ humbled himself more than you can imagine him humbling himself christ loved us sacrificially more than you can imagine and when he did that he fulfilled the scripture in isaiah 53 that says he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus was being hung on the cross between those two thieves. And that was a fulfillment of this scripture that he was numbered with the transgressors. He made intercession for those who crucified him. He was pleading. Now, think, now look at this. These people are nailing his hands to the cross. They are crucifying him. They are torturing him. They are mocking him. They're making fun of him. He's making intercession for them. He is pleading on their behalf. He is asking forgiveness for them. In Luke uh, chapter 23, verse 34, in our passage today, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He made intercession for them. Yes. He saved the thief. He's hanging beside these two thieves, and the Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, both of them were mocking him in the beginning. But one of them repents, and one of them says, says, Remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus says, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So he is numbered with the transgressors. He has humbled himself. He has been degraded. He has been tortured. He has been treated shamefully. shamefully. He's hanging there on the cross. He's suffering, but he is still praying for people. He is still asking for forgiveness for people and he hangs the thief he hangs he saves the thief that is hanging on the cross next to him he stepped down from heaven to be counted with us john 1 14 says the word that's jesus and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth he stepped down from heaven 
to be a man, to be with us. Psalm 8, 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? He stepped down from heaven to be a man. And when he became a man, he was numbered among us, among the human race. He was numbered with the transgressors because, well, we're transgressors too. Romans 3, 9, and 10 says, What then are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles all under sin. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, 23 says, For the wages, no. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Jesus came down to be with man, to be with men, to be with people, he was with the transgressors. He was with the sinners. He humbled himself. He showed his love by humbling himself so that he could fulfill the plan of salvation for us. And during the process, he was mocked and rejected. If you look in verse 35, it says, And the people stood beholding. The people stood beholding. The people, you know, they mocked him and rejected him. They, they were part of the reason he was there. Pilate gave him the option, Shall I release Jesus or shall I release Barabbas and they said Barabbas you know free Barabbas well shall I crucify your king and they said he's not our king we have no king but Caesar they rejected him what shall I do with your king crucify him crucify him they caught these people are mocking him they called on Pilate to crucify Jesus Pilate didn't want to crucify Jesus but he wanted to keep the people in line and keep them happy and so he crucified Jesus just to put the people to silence just to shut those people up the people stood beholding because they had rejected him how many people are rejecting Christ today how many people out how many people in here but how many people out there are rejecting Christ today they, they may have embraced the religion but they've they rejected the Savior they may have embraced the holidays but they're rejecting the Savior they don't know Jesus as their Savior they're not willing to place their faith in him to get them into heaven they want to rely on their own good works or being a good person being a good person you know good people go to heaven bad people go to hell right no people whose sins have been paid for who have accepted that payment on their sins they're the ones who go to heaven people are rejecting Christ they mocked him. They rejected him. In verse 35, And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. The rulers. These are the religious leaders, the priests and the Pharisees. These are the ones who spent their entire lives studying the Scriptures, memorizing the Scriptures, being knowledgeable in the Scriptures. Jesus said in John 5, 39, Search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The scriptures, the Old Testament, testify to Jesus. And they knew the scriptures, but they rejected Jesus. They rejected the scriptures. And they led other people to reject Christ. Religious leaders, preachers, are supposed to lead people to Christ. These preachers in this passage, they led people to reject Christ. And I wonder how many religious leaders today lead people away from Christ. They lead people away from Christ. They lead people to prosperity. Or they lead people to help the preacher's prosperity. Or they lead people to follow a religion, to follow a set of rules, to follow a strict guideline for life. Or they lead people to follow their personality. As long as you're following the preacher, you're okay. Don't worry about Jesus. Just follow what the preacher says and, you know, go everywhere the preacher says to go and show up every time the preacher preaches and watch his TV show and listen to his radio show and buy his books and just, just consume everything the preacher throws at you. That preacher ought to be leading you into the scriptures. And if he writes a book, it should open up the scriptures to you and if he has a tv show it should be to preach the word if he has a radio show it should be to preach the word when he holds services it should be to preach the word and, and to facilitate corporate worship but a lot of religious leaders today lead people away from christ they lead them to a denomination or they lead them to a personality or they lead them to themselves or they lead them to to financial prosperity the rulers mocked him they rejected him and then the soldiers mocked him after reaching out to soldiers jesus reached out to the roman soldiers the occupiers the ones who were occupying his home country he reached out to them he healed the centurion servant 
he praised that centurion whose servant that he healed, saying that he had not seen so great a faith in Israel. But these soldiers who nailed him to the cross, they rejected him. The world mocks Jesus regardless of what he did for them. In our modern society, Jesus has become a cartoon character. And they have Jesus saying all kinds of things on these cartoons and these bumper stickers and these t-shirts that Jesus wouldn't say. The soldiers mocked him. Look in verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Not only is everybody there making fun of him, not only are the people rejecting him, making fun of him, the soldiers, the religious rulers, now this common criminal uncommon criminal, he's a bad criminal, hanging next to him, is making fun of him. That word rail means to speak evil of. So this guy is not only making fun of him, but he's demanding to be delivered. This guy who probably hurt some people, probably killed somebody, probably stole something very valuable, probably ruined somebody's life, is hanging here next to Jesus and saying, hey, you ought to be saving me. But this man didn't accept Jesus as his Savior. Now the man on the other side I think it was over here. It's usually where we draw them, isn't it? This man over here on this other side, he says, Dost thou not fear God? You see the difference in attitude? This man's demanding. He's railing against. He is griping at Jesus. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 4 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy in the Old Testament that he would bear our sins, and while he's bearing our sins, we would reject him. We would esteem him smitten. We would esteem him stricken. We would, we would turn our faces from him. He was mocked. He was rejected by men. He was, he was degraded. He was hurt. He was treated as shamefully as anybody could be treated. But yet he continued fulfilling the gospel. He completed the gospel. In verse 46. He cried with a loud voice saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He died for our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Jesus hung there on the cross, do you know why he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It wasn't because God turned his back on him. It's because God was pouring out his wrath on him, and he was punishing him. Isaiah 53, 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Christ hung on that cross and he died for our sins. When he died for our sins, he satisfied God's need for judgment. And there had to be judgment. That, that, that wasn't just an unreasonable need that God had. When those planes hit those towers on 9-11, you knew we were going to war because we could not allow an attack that brazen on our home soil to go without a response. We were going to have to respond to that attack. And when you sinned against God, he had to respond to that. But his response was taken out on Jesus, not you. His suffering justified us. It declared us even with God. If I owed you money and Jessica paid the money that I owed you and said this is on Leland's behalf, you don't need the money from me anymore because you got the money from me. I'm justified with you. We're even. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He declared us even. He paid our debt for us. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. God will divide him a portion with the great. Christ was rewarded for completing the gospel. God raised him from the dead. He sits at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession for us. And he will make intercession for you. He will save you. Verse 40. 
the other, talking about the other thief, rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? This thief was saying, Don't you fear God? Don't you believe in God? Don't you believe this man is God? Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This thief believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And he believed that he existed. He believed he was right there in front of him. He trusted him. He believed that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In verse 41, this thief says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. This thief is, is sorry for his sin. He, he sees that he deserves to be in the spot that he is in. He sees that he deserves to be hanging on that cross, but he also sees that Jesus is dying, not deserving to be there. This man confesses his sins. In verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He asked Christ for salvation. He saw him as being God in the flesh. He believed God. He trusted God. He had faith in God. He repented of his sins, and he asked God for salvation. He asked Christ for salvation. Isaiah one eighteen says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be as sackcloth, they shall be, as, they shall be white as snow. And Christ said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. doesn't matter what you've done in life. doesn't matter how low, how horrible, what wretched things you have gotten into. If you are sorry for that and you're turning away from that and you turn toward God and you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he saved you. And today you'll be with me in paradise. You'll be with him in paradise. Those ancient cities, they had walls, walls to protect the city from the outside, walls within the city to protect the high-class folks from the working-class folks. You accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You repent of that sin. You ask him to save you. Jesus told this thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He was, that thief was going to be with Jesus in paradise. He wasn't going to be locked out of the outer wall of heaven, but at least he's alive. And he wasn't going to be locked in the, in, the, in the poor neighborhood in the housing project, not able to go to the good part of town where Jesus is. He was going to be with Jesus that day. God will save you. God will save anybody. We look in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, you have a peculiar situation. These same people who, who a few months ago had called for Jesus to be crucified, a few months has passed by the time you get to Acts chapter 2, and these people are back in town for the, uh, for the Feast of the Pentecost. And they were there, and Peter started preaching to them. And he said in Acts 2.36, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, those people had stood in that crowd, and they screamed, Crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. And Peter said, That man that y'all did that to was the Messiah that y'all have been looking for all these years. He was the Savior. That was their sin. They rejected Christ. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Do you ever feel that intense guilt in your heart? That's sorrow over sin. And Josh understands that, by the way. I said something to Josh one day, and he started crying, told me I struck him in his heart. You ever been, you ever been struck in your heart? They were pricked. They were struck in their heart. They realized that they had rejected the Christ. They were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So they have sorrow for sin, and they want to know what to do. In verse 38 of Acts chapter 2, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what did he say? He said, repent. That means to change your mindset, to change your thinking. That means to turn away from your sin, turn to Christ. And that's when you have your belief. When you turn from your sin, you turn to Christ. That's when you are believing in Christ. That's when you're expressing your belief in Christ. That's the way of salvation. Repentance is the way of salvation. But he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. That baptism is not part of salvation. That baptism is part of discipleship. That's following Jesus. So turn from your sins. Trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. 
and then follow him. A lot of people turn. A lot of people turn and look toward Christ. But then they don't follow. They just stand there looking to him. And they'll be saved, but they'll never grow beyond where they are at that point. Don't just turn from your sins and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Follow him, too. Let's stand and have a hymn of invitation.